We know through painful experience that freedom is never voluntarily given by the oppressor. It must be demanded by the oppressed. Frankly, I have yet to engage in a direct action campaign that was well-timed in view of those who have not suffered unduly from the disease of segregation. For years now, I have heard the word wait. It rings in the ear of every Negro with piercing familiarity. This wait has almost always meant never. We must come to see with one of our distinguished jurors that justice too, laid, too long delayed is justice denied. We have waited for more than 340 years for our constitutional and God-given rights. The nations of Asia and Africa are moving with jet-like speed toward gaining political independence. But we still creep at horse and buggy pace toward gaining a cup of coffee at a lunch counter. Perhaps it is easy for those who have never felt a steam darts of segregation to say, wait. But when you have seen vicious mobs lynch your mothers and fathers at will and drown your sisters and brothers at whim, when you have seen hate-filled policemen curse, kick, and even kill your black brothers and sisters, when you see the vast majority of your 20 million Negro brothers smothering in an airtight cage of poverty in the midst of an affluent society, when you suddenly find your tongue twisted and your speech stammering, as you seek to explain to your six-year-old daughter why she can't go to the public amusement park that has been just been advertised on television and see tears welling up in her eyes when she is told that Funtown has closed the colored children and see ominous clouds of inferiority beginning to form in her little mental sky and see her beginning to distort her personality by developing an unconscious bitterness towards white people. When you have to concoct an answer for a five-year-old son who is asking, Daddy, why do white people treat colored people so mean? When you take a cross-country drive and find it necessary to sleep night after night in the uncomfortable corners of your automobile because no motel will accept you. When you are humiliated day in and day out by nagging signs reading white and colored, when your first name becomes nigger, your middle name becomes boy, however old you are, and your last name becomes John. And your wife and mother are never given the respected title Mrs. When you are harried by day and haunted by night by the fact that you are a Negro, living constantly a tiptoe stance, never quite knowing what to expect next, and are plagued with inner fears and outer resentments, when you are forever fighting a degenerating sense of nobodiness, then you will understand why we find it difficult to wait. There comes a time when the cup of endurance runs over and men are no longer willing to be plunged into the abyss of despair. I hope, sirs, you can understand our legitimate and unavoidable impatience. You express a great deal of anxiety over our willingness to break laws. This is certainly a legitimate concern. Since we so diligently urge people to obey the Supreme Court's decision in 1954 outlawing segregation in pub the public schools, at first glance it may seem rather paradoxical for us consciously to break laws. One may ask, how can you advocate breaking some laws and obeying others? The answer lies in the fact that there are two types of laws, just and unjust. I would be the first to advocate obeying just laws. One 
has not only a legal, but a moral responsibility to obey just laws. Conversely, one has a moral responsibility to disobey unjust laws. I would agree with St. Augustine that an unjust law is no law at all. The Three Dimensions of a Complete Life, April 9, 1967, New Covenant, Baptist Church, Chicago, Illinois. Now, the other thing about the length of life, after accepting ourselves and our tools, we must discover what we are called to do. And once we discover it, we should set out to do it with all of our strength and all of our power that we have in our systems. And after we discover what God called us to do, after we discover our life's work, we should set out to do that work so well that the living, the dead, or the unborn couldn't do it any better. Now this does not mean that everybody will do the so-called big, recognize things of life. Very few people will rise to the heights of genius in the arts and in the sciences. Very few collectively will rise to the certain professions. Most of us will have to be content to work in the fields and in the factories and on the streets but we must see the dignity of all labor. When I was in Montgomery, Alabama, I went to the shoe shop quite often, known as Gordon's Shoe Shop. And there was a fellow in there that used to shine my shoes. And it was just an experience to witness this fellow shining my shoes. He would get that rag, you know, and he could bring music out of it. And I said to myself, this fellow has a PhD in shoe shining. What I'm saying to you this morning, my friends, even if it falls your lot to be a street sweeper, go on out and sweep streets like Michelangelo painted pictures. Sweep streets like Handel and Beethoven composing music. Sweep streets like Shakespeare wrote poetry. Sweep streets so well that all of the hosts of heaven and earth will have to pause and say, here lived a great street sweeper who swept his job well. If you can't be a pine on the top of the hill, be a scrub in the valley but be the best little scrub on the side of the hill. Be a bush if you can't be a tree. If you can't be a highway, just be a trail. If you can't be a sun, be a star. Isn't by size you win or fail. Be the best of whatever you are. And when you do this, when you do this, you've mastered the length of life. This onward push to end of self-fulfillment is the end of a person's life. Now, don't stop here, though. You know, a lot of people get no further than life than the length. They develop their inner powers. They do their jobs well. But do you know, they try to live as if nobody else lives in the world but themselves. And they use everybody as mere tools to get where they're going. They don't love anybody but themselves. And the only kind of love that they really have for other people is utilitarian love. You know, they just love people that they can use. A lot of people never get beyond the first dimension of life. They use other people as mere steps by which they can climb to their goals and their ambitions. These people don't work out well in life. They may go for a while. They may think that they're making it all right. But there's a law. They call it the law of gravitation in the physical universe. And it works. It's final and inexorable. Whatever goes up can come down. You shall reap what you sow. God has structured the universe that way. And he who goes th through his life, not concerned about others, will be a subject, victim of this law. So I move on and say that it is necessary to add breadth to length. Now the breadth of life is the outward concern for the welfare of others. As I said, and a man has not begun to live until he rises above the narrow confines of his own individual concerns to broader the concerns of all humanity. Let it be sound. Let it be sound. Jonesboro and Washington County have a strong African-American history. Prior to the Civil War, both enslaved and free people of color called Washington County home. In the 1860 census, there were 952 enslaved people in Washington County. At the same time, there were more free people of color in Washington County than there were in the entire state of Arkansas. 
members of the enslaved population fought in the Battle of Kings Mountain during the Revolutionary War alongside their enslavers, and they worked in Jonesboro's hotels like the Chester Inn and on the farms of the larger landowners in Washington County. Washington County also had a strong abolitionist movement led by the Quakers in the late 1700s and early 1800s. The Emancipator, published and funded by Quaker Elihu Embry, began circulation on April 30, 1820. The Emancipator was the first periodical dedicated exclusively to the cause of abolitionism. Jacob Howard's print shop, now destroyed, stood on the corner of Main Street and First Avenue in Jonesboro's historic district. The paper had seven editions and a readership in Boston and Philadelphia. Elihu Embry passed away in December of 1820. In his will, Embry sought to manumit his enslaved woman, Nancy, and her five children. In stark contrast to his beliefs, Embry was an enslaver for most of his life. He was honest to a degree about his shortcomings in The Emancipator. Despite these shortcomings, his paper helped influence and champion the cause of abolitionism. In 1842, Washington County farmer Lloyd Ford Sr. passed away and left a large amount of his estate to his enslaved people and children, including Peggy, Rhoda, and Edward. He also manumitted them in his will. His white children protested the will, and the case went first to the Washington County Court before making it to the Tennessee Supreme Court. Ford's enslaved heirs were not allowed to stand trial, so Phoebe Stewart, a white woman, agreed to be their next friend and testify on their behalf. In his final judgment, Supreme Court Justice Nathan Green upheld the decision of the Washington County Court and ruled in favor of Peggy, Rhoda, and Edward, saying, A slave is not in the condition of a horse or an ox. His liberty is restrained, it is true. But he is made after the image of the Creator. He has mental capacities and an immortal principle in his nature that constitute him equal to his owner, before the accidental position in which fortune has placed him. Finally, in 1850, Ford's enslaved children gained their freedom and their rightful portion of the estate. Today, members of the Ford family, both black and white, gather for a family reunion. Following the Civil War, Union Army veteran and formerly enslaved person Jeremiah Edwards established a school and church in Jonesboro for the black community. Alfred Martin Ray and his twin brother John Ray were also born into enslavement. They were enslaved by Dr. Joseph Ray and were most likely his biological children. After the Civil War and Emancipation, Alfred enlisted in the U.S. Army. He was part of the 10th U.S. Cavalry, known as the Buffalo Soldiers. He fought in the Spanish-American War at the Battle of San Juan Hill, where he was credited with helping carry the American flag to the top of the hill. In 1898, he married Etta Smith of Jonesboro, and when he retired from the armed forces, after over 20 years, they settled in town on West Woodrow Avenue. He passed away on July, July 11, 1917, and is buried in College Hill Cemetery. In 1874, James C. Cousins and James A. Bailey ran for trustee and register in the local election. They were the first African Americans to run for office in Jonesboro. James C. Cousins was a barber, and his barber shop was on Main Street near the courthouse. He also owned a candy store. The two men were ultimately defeated in the election, but the Herald and Tribune reported on their historic run, saying, They are both industrious men, and their claims are entitled to consideration. In 1876, Yardley Warner opened the Warner Institute, a school for the freedmen at the top of East Main Street. Jonesboro has always been committed to education. In addition to schools for boys, the town housed the Holston Baptist Female Institute and the Odd Fellows Female Academy. Following the Civil War, Yardley Warner worked with the Friends Freedmen's Association to establish a school for people recently manumitted from enslavement in Jonesboro. The school was maintained until 1887 by teacher and principal Julia Bullard Nelson. Nelson was very firm in her beliefs, and she had an ongoing war of words and opinions with the Jonesboro Journal. In one of her replies to them, she stated, I do believe that a black heart is infinitely worse than a black skin. 
1895, Miss Cordy Bayless became the first alumnus from the school to be a teacher there. She was Jeremiah Edwards' granddaughter. The school continued to serve the African-American community until 1917 when it was sold and became a private residence. The brick house still stands today beside the old Jonesboro Cemetery. Speaking of cemeteries, in 1896, the Colored People's Cemetery Society established College Hill Cemetery at the top of East Main Street as a final resting place for the African American community. The town's public burying ground was laid out in 1803 and called Rocky Hill. College Hill is located behind Rocky Hill and was accessible by Boone Street and Cemetery Lane. Prior to College Hill Cemetery, African Americans were restricted to burial in the back section and slope of Rocky Hill. Society and nature segregated the two cemeteries, but those boundaries have been removed, and today the two cemeteries can be viewed one from the other. They are commonly referred to as the Old Jonesboro Cemetery. Their stories are shared together on cemetery tours and ongoing preservation efforts continue to take place. At the same time the cemetery was founded, Nurse Ella Russell, a graduate of Howard Medical Training School in Washington, D.C., was advertising herself as the only hospital-trained nurse in East Tennessee. She resided with James C. Cousins in his house on West Main Street. She was his live-in nurse, but she was ready at any time to go when called upon. An African-American woman, she treated both black and white patients and was recommended by local physicians, including doctors J.S. Stewart, T.W. Whitlock, and Niles N. Warlick. When Mr. Cousins passed away, he left Ella his house as back payment for his medical debts. Ella sold the property on the corner of West Main and First Avenue, the same location of Elihu Embry's historic paper, and moved to Washington, D.C. with her husband. After the Warner Institute closed, African-American students attended the Jonesboro Colored School. The Booker T. Washington School opened on October 7, 1940, to students from the African-American community. The school was a Works Progress Administration project, and it replaced the Jonesboro Colored School, also known as the School on the Rocks, on Spring Street. The school housed grades 1st through 8th. African-American students had to be bused to Johnson City to the segregated high school at Langston. Booker T. Washington School closed in 1965 when Washington County Schools were finally integrated. Today, the building belongs to the town of Jonesboro and is an arts center for the entire community. It is named in honor of the McKinney family and their legacy. Ernest McKinney was a teacher and principal at the school from 1956 to 57. On the same day that Martin Luther King Jr. was assassinated in Memphis, Ernest McKinney was elected alderman in Jonesboro. Mr. McKinney was the first African American to be elected to the board of mayor and aldermen. His wife, Marion McKinney, was instrumental in the fight to, de to desegregate Washington County schools and worked as a guidance counselor within the system for a number of years. In 1988, their son, Kevin McKinney, was elected mayor of Jonesboro. Alfred Greenlee worked for the War Department for a number of years and was a friend to all. He was superintendent of the department. He left a lasting legacy on the town of Jonesboro. He walked the town daily, and there's a bench outside the Washington County Courthouse dedicated to him. It reminds people to take a moment to stop and smile. These are only a handful of stories from the rich African-American history of Washington County. There are so many more stories to be told. Where do we go from here? August 16, 1967, Southern Christian Leadership Conference, Atlanta, Georgia. So I conclude by saying again today that we have a task and let us go with a divine dissatisfaction. Let us be dissatisfied until America will no longer have a high blood pressure of creeds and an anemia of deeds. Let us be dissatisfied until the tragic walls that separate the outer city of wealth and comfort and the inner city of poverty and despair shall be crushed by the battering rams of the forces of justice. 
Let us be dissatisfied until those that live on the outskirts of hope are brought into the metropolis, metropolis of daily security. Let us be dissatisfied until slums are cast into the junk heaps of history and every family is living in a decent sanitary home. Let us be dissatisfied until the dark yesterdays of segregated schools will be transformed into bright tomorrows of quality integrated education. Let us be dissatisfied until integration is not seen as a problem, but as an opportunity to participate in the beauty of diversity. Let us be dissatisfied until men and women, however black they may be, will be judged on the basis of the content of the character and not on the basis of the color of their skin. Let us be dissatisfied. Let us be dissatisfied until every state capital houses a governor who will do justly, who will love mercy, and who will walk humbly with his God. Let us be dissatisfied until every city hall, justice will roll down like waters and righteousness like a mighty stream. Let us be dissatisfied until that day when the lion and the lamb shall lie down together and every man will sit under his own vine and fig tree and none shall be afraid. Let us be dissatisfied and men will recognize that out of one blood, God made all men to dwell on the face of the earth. Let us be dissatisfied until that day when nobody will shout white power, when nobody will shout black power. But everybody will talk about God's power and human power. I must confess, my friends, the road ahead will not always be smooth. There will be rocky places of frustration and meandering points of bewilderment. There will be an inevitable setbacks here and there. There will be those moments when the buoyancy of hope will be transformed into the fatigue of despair. Our dreams will sometimes be shattered and our ethereal hopes blasted. We may again, with tear drenched eyes, have to stand before the bear of some courageous civil rights worker whose life will be snuffed out by the dastardly acts of bloodthirsty mobs. Difficult and painful as it is, we must walk on in the days ahead with an audacious faith in the future. And we, and as we continue our charted course, we may gain consolation in the words so nobly left by that great black bard who was also a great freedom fighter of yesterday, James Weldon Johnson. So stony the road we trod, Bitter the chastening rod, felt in the days when hope unborn had died, yet with a steady beat, have not our weary feet come to the place for which our fathers sighed. We have come over the way that with tears have been watered. We have come tre treading our paths, though the blood of the, th of the slaughtered. Out from the gloomy past, Till now we stand at last, where the bright gleam of our bright star is cast. Let this affirmation be our ringing cry. It will give us the courage to face the uncertainties of the future. It will give our tired feet new strength as we continue our forward stride toward the city of freedom. When our days become dreary with low hovering clouds of despair, and when our nights become darker than a thousand midnights, let us remember that there is a creative force in this universe, in its universe, working to pull down the gigantic mountains of evil, a power that is able to make a way out of no way and tra transform dark yesterdays into bright tomorrows. Let us realize the arc of the moral universe is long, but it bends towards justice.
add a little something to it. Just to encourage you. We're gonna take you to church later. Let's go! We'll keep marching right until the victory is won. To all my brothers out there. Hold your head up, brothers, till the victory is won. To all my sisters in the struggle. Keep believing, sister, till the victory is won. Till that day! Till that day.